everybody. Thank you for that. Um, I feel so alone out here. I think Carrie's going to be coming out here to join me, and John Cooper's going into hiding, and maybe he might come out later. Um, but let me uh, kick this off by saying this press conference uh, has been, doing, uh, been going on for 34 years. So I've been doing this for 34 years, introducing the festival, welcoming you all because you play such a vital role in what we're doing. Without your involvement, uh, we wouldn't be seen or known much. So thank you for that. Um, the other thing is, having, having done this for, th God, it's 34 years now uh, since the festival started. Um, I think we're at a point where um, I can move on to a different place. Because the thing I've missed over the years is being able to spend time with the films and with the filmmakers and to see their work and enjoy their work and be part of their community. I've been sort of spending a lot of time introducing everything, but I don't think the festival needs a whole lot of introduction now. I think it kind of runs on its own course, and I'm happy for that. So let me just say I am grateful that you're here. Um, I want to give a real shout out to the people that I don't think get enough credit, and that is the volunteers, the people who... Uh, Yeah, thank you for that. The, the people who stand outside in the cold, they don't get paid. They're volunteers. They don't get paid. They stand outside in the cold. And they welcome people. They usher people this way and that way. And I just think they really deserve a lot of credit for that. And I, I, I honor them. So that's for that. Having said all that, um, I think it's time to bring out Carrie Putnam. <laughs> Carrie? Is Carrie retired? <laughs> oh, yeah. I think I'm going to talk, not an actor. I'm going to talk to the podium, if you don't mind here. Thank you, Bob. And um, Do I sit in the chair? Or not? I think you are going back there. You're welcome to stay in a chair, but I think they have you coming around here. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Hi, everybody, and, and thank you, Bob. Um, thanks for all you do at the festival. Um, welcome, everybody. This is, um, this is a really exciting time. It's so great to see you all here. Um, I think our programmers have put together an incredible selection of films this year, and we're so excited to kick it off tonight. It's going to be great. Um, I want to begin by reminding everybody of something that's near and dear to our heart. And it's a point that I'd love for you to include as you cover us over the next couple of weeks. This festival is a nonprofit program of Sundance Institute. There's often a misperception that the festival is a for-profit business or somehow separate from the work that the Institute does supporting artists all year long. And this is not true. There is definitely a lot of buzz happening here over the next few weeks, but at its heart, this festival is one of the most powerful ways that we support artists. We're really proud that this platform um, sustains their careers and helps them amplify their work. But further, as Bob always envisioned, this festival is a home for independent artists around the world to gather, to form a connected creative community. And the fact that this year, we've had the most submissions to the Sundance Film Festival ever, 14,200 projects, I think shows it's an indication that this vision is thriving. As journalists and critics, you guys are an enormous part of all of that. And in a couple of minutes, you're going to get to hear from all the programmers um, and, and get hear the answers to your questions. But before I bring them out, I just want to talk for a moment about what's on our mind this year, how we view our place in the world, and why we think it matters. We see Sundance as a public square for independent voices. We often consider how our purpose as a live event has, has evolved in the streaming age. Why do so many people from all over the world come to gather here? Well, we recognize that this sort of public square is in short supply right now. The consolidation of commercial media, the click optimization of the digital landscape, that means that stories, content, and information are being distributed with an eye on views and clicks rather than depth and risk. It's commerce, not purpose, that's driving most storytelling, which of course is fine as far as, far as it goes, 
but it's dangerous when there's few alternatives. This leads to the most shallow and sensational content being prioritized. The commercial media environment devalues independent media, and we're here to revalue it. We feel the urgency of coming together in person, showing up with curious open minds, stimulated by an exchange coming from art and ideas, from many perspectives that reflect our world today. So the festival, when you, when you come to think about it, when you come to frame it, the streaming and the independent acquisitions markets are always going to be a story, and they may rise and fall. But the role of the festival for us is about something bigger. It's about art. It's about culture. It's about community. And how artists are going to lead us to places that we might not otherwise go. I think our culture as a whole has failed to recognize the critical role art and artists play in making sense of our world. Artists have an unapologetic subjectivity, a fearlessness in directing our gaze, and imaginative minds to envision future possibilities that are data driven, that are not data driven, but human centered. So we are really proud that they're in the center of the frame here. Among the artists here, elevating diversity of voices and perspectives has been a huge priority for us. The obstacles are real, but we feel we have a unique way to contribute beyond, of course, the selections we make in the program. For example, this year we've done something that no other festival has done, to our knowledge. We've published demographic data on all of our applicants to the festival and to the labs. You might wonder why it's important to know more about who's submitting. Because knowing who's applying helps us understand the talent pipeline, where underrepresented people may be falling out, and how to direct our resources and efforts to represent the full spectrum of voices. But this data reveals a picture that has a broader relevance beyond Sundance, I think for the field as a whole, too. So we worked with Dr. Stacy Smith and her team at the USC Annenberg Center, and tomorrow we're announcing their findings in a new report. Stacy's going to do a panel on it at 2 p.m. in the Filmmaker Lodge, so I really encourage you to go check that out. Um, and by the way, our panels this year are wonderful. I know the programmers will talk more about them, but as you're thinking about what's on screen, don't forget what's off screen. There's some great conversations happening. Diversity and inclusion are built into the founding DNA of Sundance Institute, but this year we realized we had a blind spot. Diversity isn't just about who's making the films, it's about how they enter the world. We realized, frankly, later than we should have, the implications of the fact that the diverse community of artists here were premiering their work to mostly white male critics. This lack of inclusion has real world implications to sales, distribution, and opportunity. So we decided to do something about it. We vastly reshaped who we accredited. I'm proud to announce that 63% of the credentialed press are from underrepresented groups this year. <laughs> yeah. But beyond that, with funding, with funding from some amazing foundations and companies, we're providing them with stipends, mentorship, and community events so that these first-time Sundancers, these critics and journalists, are able to be fully included. I want to thank all of you in this room who've been part of this effort and welcome any of you who are here from this new cohort of journalists for the first time. This community as a whole becomes richer for the diversity among all of you, the press. I can't wait to see what new perspectives and stories rise out of this effort. Finally, I want to say a word about our festival theme, risk independence. On the one hand, this theme speaks to artists taking a risk to reveal what's inside them despite what others may think. But while we celebrate the creative risks that artists may take, we shouldn't forget the more serious risks that come with being truly independent. Documentarians in particular risk being jailed and even risk their lives for sharing their truths. And those numbers around the world are at an all-time high. There are also political risks. We're featuring work from several artists who nearly didn't get visas to travel to Sundance this year. With the help of some incredible pro bono lawyers, most of them made it through. But two from Muslim banned countries did not. And even two is too many. Syrian filmmaker Suda Qada, and Iranian filmmaker Arman Fayaz will not be here with us, but their work will be here, their voices will be here. The final risk of risk independence is the risk, that, the one that audiences here take, an experience work that breaks convention and pushes us out of our comfort zone. Here we will discover beauty, surprise, joy, maybe even hope, but there also may be con controversy, discomfort, or divided opinion. That's what should happen. 
Art can't spark conversation if it's playing it safe. All right, I'm gonna get off my soapbox now. It's time for me to introduce some of my incredible colleagues. We have, an, we have a remarkable team of programmers led by our uh, festival director, John Cooper, our director of programming, Kim Yutani. Um, they created a great program. I wanna bring them out to tell you about it. And I'll bring them, they're coming this way. Here they come to tell you about it. And thank you all for being here. I look forward to seeing you around the mountain. Photos first. <laughs> All right. Oh. 1001, 1002, <laughs> 1003, 1004. Colorado. We don't look too serious, do we? <laughs> okay, good. <sighs> wow, it's the longest I've holding a stomach in for <coughs> for a year. Uh, <laughs> so I can't tell you how excited I am to be doing this because it means I'm not doing it alone. Um, I think we've, um, what I like about today and this is, I mean, this isn't the whole group of programmers. I want to say that up front. This is a selection. Um, the people we have here with us now are way down at the end. Um, Caroline Labresco, who I'm going to tell you their title, but their titles don't even, don't really even live up to what they actually do for us at the festival and the Institute. Um, Carolyn Labresco, senior programmer, focuses on documentaries, but also runs the Women's Initiative and Catalyst, which is a big program of the festival, so many hats. David Courier, um, also senior programmer, specializes in documentaries. I would say, too, he also does a London Film Festival, um, but also, and produces the award show, minor detail, um, but um, also, um, um, brings so much of the relationship building in the documentary community that, that serves us really well in programming. Shari Frilo, who is the curator of, the chief curator of New Frontier. If you haven't ever been to New Frontier, you are missing out. But her other job, besides curating, is just staying on the forefront of what this is, this whole new media thing, and new ways of telling stories, and it's quite incredible. It takes a hell of a lot of work uh, and travel. John Nine, who's our, you know, I, I think of him, you know, I think of these all as kind of superheroes from the Avenger series. Um, John has, like, power brain. Um, he's also a senior programmer. He deals with features mostly, but a lot in world cinema, and but crosses over to American and um, also is sort of heads up our, all, our whole off-screen program, which is all the panels and stuff, and keeps a good handle on that. And last but not least, as you know, we have a new director of programming at Sundance. Um, we brought her on this year. Um, she's been working with us for 14 years. She's been incredible. It's been a great year, and um, I think it's been sort of a seamless, flawless thing, which makes my life very easy. And she's intelligent, she has great taste, and that is Kim Yutani. Let's hear it. Let's hear it for all the programmers. <laughs> and like I said, there's a lot of people that are part of our team. I think we just kind of, we have 14 programmers that go into the final room, and just that's for features. And in shorts, what, what did we come up with? 10? I think 10 people that program shorts, and they're just as uh, you know, rigorous and, and um, exciting job as we have. Um, First, I want to just talk a little bit about um, our programming process, like how, how we program. And it really hasn't changed over the years. We go out to find the most interesting, um, the boldest independent voices now from around the world. That's what we do. We look for authenticity. We look for creativity. We look for originality. That is quite simple. But Every year when we do this, we're doing it in a new world. The, the world changes around us, and it has to be contextualized almost. Um, we try not to let that sort of 
be the head of what we do. We like to do those other things first, but, but um, in the end, so what is Sundance in 2019? Mm. What is, how does it feel being here now? What is the responsibility of us? And I think that for me, I'm not saying this from an ego point of view, but I think that this festival is more um, relevant in divided times than ever. I think the voices that come front in the forefront in this festival are important. I think it helps um, create the cultural landscape of, of this year, and it's what we witness, and now we get to turn over to our audiences, which is really exciting. Um, we don't have, you know, we don't have the government-guided <laughs> point of, of view, <laughs> ministry of culture, <laughs> point of view of what we're supposed to be doing. So we let our artists really guide this. And I think that's what's great about this festival is that through artists, we are seeing uh, what is important to us as people and really making us better human beings. I think that's what the films do here. Um, I'm going to shut up for a minute, but um, I think just a little, little insight into our process is we do this. We go into a room and we argue. And we argue and argue and um, we've come out with a program. But part of that is, is it's amazing the, the different points of view that we have in that room. And that's what is the secret sauce for me of, of making this festival. We all contribute to all the programs. We're not divided by that because I believe that is the win-win out of this is that, that all these voices together and that argument and the conversation and then it creates goes on to our off-screen programming and becomes part of the conversation that becomes bigger here on the mountain is what we're about and i think i'm going to turn it over to you kim to you know talk a little more about this um thank you cooper <laughs> and um it's great to be here and to see you all here it's been a real priv privilege to to lead this team and i have to say that um i would not be able to do this job without such a great team. Um, this year, uh, we had the opportunity to add a few uh, new key programmers, which I feel really elevated our, us as a collective and had a, had a huge impact on, on the program. Um, I think our team is informed by our backgrounds, our tastes, our life experiences, um, and we are a seasoned team. Like, together, we have seen thousands and thousands of films. Um, millions, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Um, like hundreds of thousands. <laughs> yes. um, so I think that when we encounter something new, like we recognize it right away. It's, uh, and we're talking about new voices, um, a new perspective, a new way of telling a story. Um, so we know when, when we see something special that how important it is for us to bring that to, to audiences. Um, and I think by, by doing that, we, we, really, we also have the opportunity to shift culture and, um, in really meaningful and, and provocative ways. So um, Cooper talked a little bit about our, our discussion list mm -hmm. meetings, um, our hotly contested meetings. But what I, what I also wanted to add to that is that I think we approach these, these meetings with a lot of respect for each other. Um, and what we what we have is a shared goal in mind. We want to put together the best festival possible. We want to show work that is, you know, that is challenging, that is creating conversation. Um, and that's what is really important to us. We also um, want, to, want to be able to share new voices with audiences. Um, and to, to have that opportunity to do that is, I think, an, an absolute joy and privilege, and to work with these guys and um, the other programmers uh, that Cooper mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something very special. So thank you to all of you guys. Um, part of how we work is, I think, really intentional and proactive, and part of that is, is how we uh, approach international work. Um, our, our program this year is filled with international films. And John, I wanted to um, toss it to you to talk a little bit more about uh, our, our international efforts. 
Yeah, um, it's a program that I think is really exceptional, um, and I hope that that is one of the stories that comes out of this festival. Um, but it's also not something that happened overnight. Um, it's the culmination, really, of years of work and a lot of thought that was put into addressing what the challenges were in building an international program. And there were, you know, there were many. Um, you know, one of them, I think, a really big one is uh, this idea of perception. Um, this overwhelming perception that exists that Sundance is an American festival for American films. And obviously we're very proud of the history that we have that's very closely tied to um, the emergence of some really amazing independent American filmmakers. But I don't think any of us wanted that you know, to be our sole identity. The idea of independence is global. It means different things in different countries, um, but it really does mean something everywhere. Um, and so, you know, I think that was a big part of what we wanted the identity to be. And then I would say another major factor really was, was a business component, and it was this idea of creating the um, sales opportunity and press visibility that producers and sales companies were looking for. Um, and that was really important to us. And so we spent a long, long time, years, uh, building relationships with those producers and sales companies really listening to them about what the challenges were and, and working with them and trying to figure out how we could create those opportunities. Um, and I think, you know, we, we sort of have always had this idea that certain films were right for Sundance and Sundance was right for certain films, but we had to prove it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to a sort of skeptical international industry. But if you do it film by film, and you really find one film that works, then another film that works, um, and they see how that success can happen, um, I think we gradually, you know, sort of worked our way to where we are now. And, and as you said, we, you know, we spend the year traveling with our ears to the ground, um, really, you know, sort of trying to find new filmmakers, tracking projects, building relationships, um, and coming up with, you know, with a program that we think is, you know, is, is of the highest caliber, really one that is of the same caliber as, as many international festivals. And I guess, you know, the, the last thing I would say is also, you know, when you think about international film, it's maybe never been more culturally relevant um, than it is now in, in our society, and this idea of looking to stories beyond our borders. And, and um, you know, I think that's true, especially of documentary film. I didn't really talk extensively about um, that same effort that exists in, in tracking and finding and building an international documentary program. But, you know, to me, those are, those are sort of the biggest things that I think were the accomplishments. Yeah. Um, so we have a press uh, question um, that we're taking from Vanessa Erasso from Vermescla. She asks, uh, you have done an excellent job of curating and supporting Latin American movies both at the festival and at the institute. Uh, do you have any concrete plans to bolster the number of films that center stories about Latinos in the U.S. Um, or are directed by U.S. Latinos that make it to the festival? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's kind of, you know, it, it, there's an international element to that, but, but it has to do with the, the history of of American film as well. I mean, I would say we, that we've actually always done that. You know, that, mm -hmm. that if you look at the program over these three decades, um, you not only see the evolution of, um, you know, the independent film movement in the US, you see this incredible array of diverse stories that pertain to, um, you know, Latino experiences in the US. Uh, so many different kinds of filmmakers of different generations. I see that as part, of, that's, that's sort of part of the texture of, of our history, you know, so I don't know that I necessarily see it as a, as a new thing, but something that to me has a continuity with our, with our whole history as a festival. I mean, they serve us so well. You know, this great product makes for a great festival. Great films, I mean, <clears throat> if you look back, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I want to switch over to documentaries and, um, David, I want to ask you, um, you know, what do you think about the state of documentary filmmaking and, and what can audiences expect from our program? Sure, um, as we know from, it's an incredible renaissance is happening in documentary filmmaking. It's, um, we have been out in front of that, I think, for a long time because you know, Sundance is unique. We're uh, incredibly fortunate. We get all the best documentary films in the world, but that fortunateness comes from choices we've made. 
we have always put documentaries on a par with fiction films for so long, and filmmakers, word spreads about that, and uh, we have become, I consider us the, the premier place to, pre to premiere your documentary in the world. Um, uh, last year, 2018, for example, is um, a, year, a historical year where four film, four documentary, independently produced documentaries made over $10 million in the box office. Now, that's a hard act to follow this year, but we have an extraordinary slate. So who knows, that could happen again. Um, you know, we are very buzzed right now because um, four of uh, the films that were nominated for the Academy Award right now premiered at our festival last year. And the other one that didn't is a beloved alumnus of our festival. So, um, you know, 2019 has a lot to live up to, but uh, we're excited. You know, I, um, Caroline and I focus on documentaries. We lead a team of six of our programmers, a really smart, diverse set of people. And as Kim mentioned, that's one of the things that is really important to us is that we remain relevant. And um, it's kind of a perfect storm for documentaries right now because documentary filmmakers are so emboldened by the current zeitgeist that, and they want their voices heard. So talk about like rising up and resisting. Resistance happens in, you know, journalism, which is, you know, we, we don't program our docs for quota. We don't program for topic ever. The topics arise. And the biggest topics of this year are, I would say, the importance of journalism to get the truth out there. I mean, you know, nowhere in our history has journalism been battered more than it's being battered right now. And uh, we've got um, some really great films that speak to that. And, um, and it's a scary time across the globe with um, the rise of the right. And uh, that has uh, become, and it's across, it's a global rise of nationalism that's being embraced by our own country, uh, certain members of our own country, which is really scary. And filmmakers, uh, you could feel them becoming incensed and creating documentaries that aren't necessarily on the nose about it, but speak, speak to that topic in a big way. And... Um, I don't know, do you have anything you want to add to that about our current slate? I mean, just, I would just add um, on top of sort of the importance and the role of journalism and the rise of the right around the world, we, those are two key themes. I think we also have an, an extraordinary number of films that, that profile really interesting characters. And the ki those characters, those are not biopics or what we call hagiographies, and we really, we debate that a lot. Because what we're looking for in films that are profiles or portraits of interesting and fascinating characters is another story, something deeper. It's, it's that these lives become windows into a larger story or a deeper issue. Yeah, and you'll I'm, see that coursing throughout the festival. Yeah, sure, they're about an individual, but every one that we pick, we seem to be, that individual's life is sh telling us something about the bigger picture. And, uh, yeah. and there are, are a lot of them. And one of the reasons we, we created our documentary premiere section is because we keep getting the master, it's for the master filmmakers of the world, partly, and partly f for films made about master leaders of the world or in what, whatever profession. And so those are coming from alumni who've had many films in competition before, but also there's first time feature filmmakers. And to speak to that, we have 45 docs, yeah. <coughs> excuse me, 17 of those are first time filmmakers. So, you know, we pride ourselves on being a festival of discovery and that really happens in the documentary world. The one thing I'll give for a historical perspective is even from the beginning, I, this is my 29th film festival, it always came from Robert Redford too. Yes. He, at the very beginning, yes. goes, we're going to do a festival yep. that is equal documentary and fiction, and um, so it's a, the same amount um, for both. So it's, he's the one who laid that groundwork for us that we just got to follow. And Absolutely. I think in the programming process, we, as Kim mentioned, you know, we really approach documentary 
fully as cinema alongside features. Everyone is engaged yeah. with documentary. Um, and I also just want to call out that I think we're one of the few places, maybe it's a very rare thing, to also be a platform for international documentary. And we really look to international documentary mm. cinema for, mm. for innovations in, <coughs> in form and storytelling. And if you avail yourself of some of those 12, you'll find some really exquisite um, new approaches to storytelling. Yeah. Great. Um, we have a question from Thomas Laffrey. Maybe you, you have touched on this already, but uh, his question is, with the current administration just having reached the two-year mark, we're now starting to see the films conceived, written, and shot during the Trump presidency. Yeah. With that in mind, I'm wondering if we can expect a certain political through line in this year's lineup and within the stories being told across the board. Um, hmm. In one word, yes. In more than one word, mm -hmm. they are fierce. Uh, yes. Some of the films that address this this particular issue, um, yeah. and I'm going I'm to talk. Actually, sp mention a few because there's, there's a number of them. Yeah. Um, Knock down the house, the brink, the edge of democracy, um, the Stieg Larsson film, Amy Berg's latest film. This is personal. The Great Hack, Cold Case Hammerschold, and Hail Satan. Um, which is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Just like it sounds. <laughs> and I almost rude. stumbled into that. Yeah, <laughs> bring the devil in at the end. But yeah, uh, yeah there's um, so there's so much, but there, it's really something documentary can do that goes even beyond journalism because they can tell a deeper dive into these stories that um, you know so much of what is on the news now is being bashed by one from one side of the right or the left at each other. So these films bring you into these people's lives in the world and um, in just a, a much more in-depth way that uh, filmmakers are really emboldened and mm -hmm. we can see that. In some ways one of our big themes really is truth. I mean, mm -hmm. through all of it. It's like, if without, the, without truth, it's just doesn't, it's always shallow and yeah. hollow. And if you get to the truth, then it grows deeper, no matter how you're coming into it from, because you have, you have a lot of different, many, many different subjects in your list. And yeah. mm -hmm. I think it's the truth that really, um, that cements it all. Yeah. Shari Frilo, you have been programming New Frontier since its inception, and it has changed so much since <laughs> that point. Um, tell us, like, what is it like to program in such a, a changing industry? What's it like to be a genius? <laughs> <laughs> the genius bar at Sunnet. <laughs> Sorry for you. Um, <laughs> you know, New Frontier is it's, it's, it's thrilling to put it together. Is. It's absolutely thrilling. Uh, it's like riding a whale, a whale, uh, <laughs> because what the program is, it's a, it's a, it's it's the intersection of film, art, and technology. It's intersectional, so you know we're, we're riding three worlds at once, uh, and 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 our artists are there at that intersection, which is why we started it in the first place. Um, and it's you know it, it's amazing what has happened, what has come out of that basement experiment that <laughs> you and I were there in the, in the very beginning. Uh, you know, in 2012, Nani De La Pena out of New Frontier uh, pretty much reincarnated uh, virtual reality as a medium, and uh, and that has effectively changed uh, the artist community. Um, uh, it's it's it, it it's effectively changed the field. And, and some economies. Um, uh, and now pretty much every major film festival has a VR section. Um, and I get thrown and, and shown and flown all over the world uh, because of this new world, this new field that's, that's developed. And, uh, and it's, it's amazing to, to, to talk to the artists, to talk to the people who are running this world. Uh, and so for this year, you know, what I've really noticed uh, is that we're at an inflection point. Um, and what that is, is that, uh, you know, VR is a, is, is a tool for artists to tell stories that completely captivate your attention. And now what we're starting to see, uh, and, leave, and, and leaving the user in a kind of like a solitary experience, but now what we're starting to see are artists using, finding ways to create uh, experiences and story worlds where other people are a part of it. Whether they are uh, um, meeting each other in a virtual reality with other people, 
uh, but most notably, the human body is coming back into the uh, story experience. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the thing that is, I find, really fresh, a really important uh, uh, new wave of work that, that pretty much characterizes, I think, this edition of New Frontier. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so, oh, also, I wanted to talk about the new venue. Maybe you can talk oh, about yeah, yeah. the new, fr new, new Frontier venue. Yes, I, I love that we've been in the city. We have such, we're, we're now the leaders of urban uh, reclamation. Cause <laughs> we took, we took um, the sports authority that was closed, turned it into the Ray Theater, put the New Frontier, and now we have a new venue to check out. Probably all know where the fresh market is. The Ray's here. On the other side, there's the Rite Aid um, Walgreens. Walgreens. Um, and next to it, there was an old blockbuster, ironically enough. Um, <laughs> and um, so there's a big black box right there. And now that has turned into New Frontier Central. So we have a permanent place to make this gallery salon. And I was in there the other day. It is so exciting in there. And those, film, and those makers of this work are so excited and so excited because they, they don't get this kind of um, opportunity. They don't go to film festivals. So this is a chance to meet audience after they've been living in their own worlds. It's really exciting. It's, it's, and it came right at the right time because we needed that space. You know, as the human body comes into the frame, right. it, the work uh, operates on that scale and scope. Yeah. And so, you know... Uh, and it's not, and I just should have said, it's not ticketed either. It's open yeah, right. and for credentials, so anybody can go in there. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You'll find a lot of the Magic Leap works, if mm. uh, anybody's interested. There are three projects, and two of them are in the New Frontier Central. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a press question um, mm -hmm. for Shari, I think. Uh, Kevin Kunze from 360 Today asks, what are your thoughts on AR, VR storytelling versus traditional filmmaking? Well, careful. <laughs> um, I mean, storytelling, cinema, um, where, how it acts on you or one, how you, how you actually, the, your response comes from a biochemical reaction. The feelings um, sets a, a reaction inside of your body that makes you, uh, you know, re respond emotionally. Uh, and in a theater, in a traditional theater, you're doing all of that change inside of your body in a seat. Your body's not moving. Mm. But in immersive, tech, not, you know, immersive forms with VR, AR, immersive theater, your body is actually a part of that response. And so, you know, when you move your body, when you run, you change your biochemistry. So you're, you're listening to stories and your bo body's moving. So there is a very more profound, deeper ingestion of what the storytelling is, and and thereby, you know, as you move forward, t making decisions in your life, referring to the stories that you you saw, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it goes deeper. It, right. it affects you deeper. And as stories enter more into this realm of the technology, it just becomes deeper and becomes richer um, and intimate. It's funny how yeah. intimate this thing is. This whole new art mm -hmm. ways of telling stories. Yeah, your body feels it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful answers. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we've talked a lot about films and now Frontier, New, New Frontier, um, but there's really just so much more to the festival. And you know, I think we all have felt that there's a real sense of community here, not just in the industry sense, but in the way of, of we're convening people and we are having really interesting, rewarding conversations. And Caroline, you're participating in several, um, yeah. including our inaugural talent form. Yeah. Can you tell us more. Yeah, it's so funny because right on the heels of you talking about intimacy and you talking about engaging the body in a kind of activeness, you know. So it's like Sundance by design is not just a passive experience. By design, we are engineering as much dialogue and discourse as we possibly can. And I think that is the uniqueness, of course, of film festivals, is that we have the opportunity to foster dialogue. We have the opportunity to create a public square, to use Carrie's language, um, and create points of moments of engagement between the audience and the artists, between the artists and the topics that they are choosing to tell, um, between the audience and the subjects of the especially documentaries that are coming through. I mean, there are so many incredible subjects coming to, to, to step off the screen and engage people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, 
Reza from Knock Down the House, Reza from the Wu-Tang Clan documentary series, um, Brian Stevenson from a film called Always in Season, um, the, the, um, he is the, the head of the Equal Justice Initiative. David Crosby will be here. The uh, you know, very provocative um, organizers of the, of the Women's March movement who've been in the press for the last month, Tamika Mallory and Linda Sarsour, will be here. And they will all be here to engage with the audience. Um, and it, it happens, of course. And Dr. Ruth. And Dr. <laughs> Ruth, thank you, Dr. Ruth, very important. Um, and um, of course, these happen at our curated panel program, which is so rich. Um, and John is deeply involved with this, of course. Um, you know, it, th this weekend, there's a whole series at the Filmmaker Lodge about art and democracy, um, looking at the, great, the film The Great Hack and, and many other, um, many, many other uh, artists talking about the convergence points, the inflection points um, between art and democracy. Um, so th our curated panel program, our, our power of story, our tentpole panels, p power of story, um, our very intimate chats also at the Filmmaker Lodge through Cinema Cafe. Um, and then, of course, in the theaters, those, those Q and A's, um, where people really connect. Um, but also outside of our official venues, at places like the Fresh Market in the aisle, um, and in the chapstick in, aisle, the chapstick aisle, <laughs> the waiting in line, you know, in the, on the waitlist line, and of course, the uh, the ever present shuttles, um, where people really debate. People hotly debate the films. They connect. They 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 realize they know each other's second cousin, you know, that they're connected. Um, these are, um, this is the community, and this is the way that Sundance is engaging people. Um, and there's a, one thing I've noticed over the years, which I really love, and which makes me really proud, is that I think that this film festival has a democratizing force. I think because we are all, we all receive the films together at the same time, and that when you're in a theater, you are equal in front of the screen. Um, and so there's a, there's a way in which um, everyone has equal access to ideas and to knowledge um, at this festival. And then finally, I want to talk about this new program that Kim mentioned, um, which we are inaugurating this year. It's called the Talent Forum, the Sundance Institute Talent Forum. And this is a three-day convening and gathering that allows us to not just put audiences together with artists, but to put artists together with industry and artists together with artists, with each other. It's three days of meetings where we're bringing 100, over 100 fellows who are active um, at the Sundance Institute across all the programs. Um, and they all have their new projects and they will all be meeting with industry to advance those projects. Um, there's also a, a, an incredible, um, I think, collection of, uh, of keynotes. Um, there'll be a keynote with, with Ryan Coogler and New York Times critic uh, and, and culture writer um, Jenna Wortham. There'll be a conversation um, about the state of documentary. Um, with all many of the those who are nominated right now for, for Academy Awards, um, and there'll be all kinds of gatherings. So we're really excited, and we think actually this will be an incredibly meaningful part of the festival in the second half, Tuesday through Thursday. Right, wonderful. Um, we have another question from the press, and it comes from Natalia Solache from Aldea, Utah, hmm. um, who asks something I noticed today is a lot of female part participation at all levels. What do you see different from other festivals that makes this happen at Sundance? Caroline, do you want to? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm going to answer that as the director of women at, at Sundance, which is a program that we started seven years ago. I started with Carrie Putnam. And I'm really proud to say, actually, that first of all, um, supporting and, and nurturing women artists has, has always been in our DNA. And it's been happening for 34 years. Um, and, um, but at, but at the same time, I can't speak to other festivals. Her question asked about other festivals. But what I can say about our, our in, uh, about the Sundance Institute is that our leadership, um, the chair of our, the, our, our board of trustees is 50% women. The chair of our board of trustees is Pat Mitchell, a woman. She's right back there. Hi, Pat. Um, our executive director, as you met, uh, Carrie Putnam, uh, the lead, and 50% of the institute's staff leadership is also uh, female. And then on the, on the level of artists, um, as I said, um, you know, our, la our, our institute lab programs are at 50% women. Um, you know, at the festival, we're, we're, this year, we're really proud to say that 40%, 47% of directors across all 
films and pieces of art in the festival were directed by women. Um, we still have a long way to go because, and we'll see if that sustains. We have to, you know, mm. we have to really keep working. But we, at the Sundance Institute, we are a pipeline. We are a pipeline. We have to keep filling that pipeline. So our commitment, though we've always had the commitment in our mission to, to support underrepresented singular voices, our commitment in the last, especially seven years since we founded uh, Women at Sundance, and now with our full outreach and inclusion program, um, I think our, our efforts are even more targeted and focused to kind of expand that, expand our, the access points into the institute so we can fill that pipeline. And I think um, it's reaping rewards. It's, 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 um, it's showing, it's showing. We have hired a number of women programmers too. And also women programmers, yeah. yeah. And of course our press, our press initiative. Mm -hmm. so. Thanks Go for ahead. the question. Can I hit these? Sure. I was handed some new questions that came through. I'm going to read them, jump in. We're going to, we're going into the free for all part of this. <laughs> um, this is from Sean Means at the Salt Lake Tribune. I love Sean. <laughs> um, but what message does the slate of films playing at Sundance say to the world about the current state of affairs in America? In part two, and how does that message differ from the ones the world gets from other sources, such as political leaders? Just the first part, I thought let's play the one word game. What, what, what? What, is it, what is the message that you think we're getting from our slate of films about the state of America? Jump in. Fearless. Okay. In one word? Yeah. Um, emboldened. Provocative. Unflinching. I said two. Two yeah. words. And I'm <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Perspective. Mm, that's a good one. Real. Real, yes, absolutely. And I think and sometimes for me even it's, it's, it's weird as it is to say optimistic. I mean there's something when mm -hmm. stories are getting out and they're deep, it's optimistic even if it feels troubled out there. I feel like somehow we're going to someplace better. Um, how does that message differ from the, world, from the ones we get from our political leaders? Well, pretty much the opposite. Um, <laughs> um, to have your voice heard is a pretty optimistic thing. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to answer the second one so much. Does anybody, do you have any? Well, I mean, I, I said perspective because I think um, politics and political leadership uh, often try to claim the authority of stories. Right. Right. And these are the stories. And, and I think, you know, it really is that genuine perspective. <laughs> and especially when, you know, it's being fostered by, as we say, these independent voices. These are the stories that we should all, and the stories and the experiences and the ideas um, that you know, are often tried, political leadership tries to embrace, and, and this is maybe somehow more genuine. I do love too, back to when you were talking right at the beginning, the, um, that, the whole, uh, the, the non-biopic that's deeper than a biopic, yeah. but it's funny, we have a whole slate of ones about the not so good people and, <laughs> and the amazing people and how that even is in conflict at this festival, which I think is fascinating to tell the deeper story of who we are as an America. Oh yeah, we have I... heroes, we have villains, we have, mm -hmm. you know, celebrities. We have people that you have never heard of before and a mm -hmm. gorgeous portrait doc is made about them and you're about to get to know them. It's really cool. But I also think that, um, that, that politics right now, you know, Sean's talking about like how, to, how do the films sort of offer a counterpoint to politics. And I think sound bites, um, you know, po politics and our news cycle is about sound bites. And it's over in 10, you know, the next story comes 10 minutes later. And I think what, obviously, what these films do is they go deeper, obviously, but they also humanize. Um, they, they, and they, they show us really complex characters. And, um, you know, we get to observe something both, you know, on both sort of the, the full range of, um, thinking around a particular issue or a full range of flaws and successes within one character. I think that's It's not so black and white either. Yeah, Never no, black and white. a lot of gray. Yeah, a lot of gray. Yeah, Did you is. get what you needed, Sean? <laughs> oh, there he is. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is from um, Jade Byron of Micah Scoop TV. <clears throat> what would it take to increase the number of people of color and deaf black talent, both on camera and behind the camera, what would it take for us to have our own television show? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll <laughs> jump in on this. Um, I just we, say yes. 
<laughs> yes. Just do it. Do it. Yeah. Part of it is do it. Um, but also, I think that we have we have a great indie episodic uh, mm. slate this year, um, and that is showcasing episodic work that is being made independently. Um, and to Cooper's point, um, we suggest you <laughs> think like our filmmakers from the 90s and just do it yourself. Um, but also, we're giving you this great platform. Um, maybe somebody will hear the answer to this question and hear you and, uh, you know, and give you an opportunity. Because I think that, you know, while you're asking about something that is very specific, I think those are the, the specificity of a story is really what resonates with people. People connect to um, something that is told in a truthful and authentic way. Um, and you know, I think that that's that's really important in in the work being made right now. And that actually, I think, is what um, can can lend to success. Mm -hmm. Does Jade that asked that question? Yeah, I've been watching Jade's movies all along. You're good. Are you are you here? We we have your eye, our eye on you. Yeah, oh. I have my eye on you for years. <coughs> uh, keep stepping forward into the spotlight. It's a, it, times are changing, and just keep stepping forward. Keep doing the good work you're doing. You just touched on something that we also do a lot of is tracking talent. <laughs> you, yeah. you just you just proved it right there. But, but we know some we know so many filmmakers that don't they don't know that we know them yeah. already. <laughs> They're on lists and we go over it every year. What have they got? We're watching everything. Yes, we are. So this is from Brandon Gaylord of When You're Not Working. Oh, I'd like that be on that one. <laughs> um, um, many of the selected films, including competition entries, already have major distribution companies attached to them. How do you balance the independent nature of the festival and its artistry with the business side of film, especially with streaming services and other advancements shaking up the status quo? There's about three questions in there. Um, I think. I'll just do the first one, is that we do have a section of the festival that is for, mm -hmm. generally for films that have distribution. That's the premiere section. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we created it. In, in, in fact, in recent years, there hasn't been as much from the companies and even independently made looking for acquisitions are in premiere section as well. That's been sort of new in the last, I'd say, 10 years. And then Spotlight too, right? <laughs> and in Spotlight. That's where we show films that play at other festivals that we just fall in love with. It was like, you know, it's our guilty pleasure. That have distribution. Right. Mostly. And that's kind of where, why they, where that's from. But I, do you want to talk to at all about the, the, the rest? I don't, I actually didn't think we had as many this year in competition, American competition. Mm -hmm. World cinema competition? A couple. But, couple. but it's worth noting that of those with distribution, several of them are first-time filmmakers. Mm -hmm. right. And, you know, to maybe it, it sort of has to do with the fact that distribution and the trends and distribution sort of ebb and flow, um, but they don't necessarily reflect, you know, a lot of those films still have challenges. And, and some of those the market and <coughs> that were independently produced were bought by companies after we chose the movie. Or yeah, or in, like in the it, mix. And I think it bears saying that, of course, even though the over-the-tops are, the streaming services are um, producing a ton of, of content, as we know. Um, you know, independent documentarians, especially, and independent feature filmmakers, we, there are still so many who do, not, who do not have that privilege of being fully financed through the over the tops. Um, and the, there, are, there are thousands of them, as we, and we see them and we support them at the Institute through our programs. Um, and it, it remains extremely challenging to put financing together for these small independent films that you'll see throughout the festival. I think in how we balance the artistry with the industry is we still lead with what is right for the filmmakers. That's our, right. Our industry office even was created because the filmmakers and the films that are coming here needed us to, to manage that because it's such an ungangly thing that that's what that's about, to make sure the right people get into the films. And we do lots of talking to people and lots of um, what we do is, is making sure that the films here are finding the right people, helping us guide that, turning on you know, acquisitions, executives to things that they're looking for. So I think that's part of it too. I think it's, it's natural, but it doesn't lead us, I guess well, is what I'm saying. You know, there's so much content be being made today, way more than there was even 10 years ago. And our job is to vet that content 
And the industry, you know, happens to think we're pretty good vetters, I guess. So, um, and so that there's, you know, this is kind of stuff is going on there because um, mm -hmm. it's all in support of the filmmaker. And we all, we say all the time, yeah. we use the word discovery. We're a festival of discovery and that's, that's what it takes, I think. Um, how much time do we have left? Is there, I, I don't know if you Oh, it's we're the end. end. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, well, that's nice to We know. didn't look over to the left. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, right. I forgot where I was supposed to be looking. Conveniently. At. So, any closing words? Let's, Kim, do you have any closing words? Uh, we want to play the one word game? Oh, <laughs> again? <laughs> um, no, I think I, I just want to say that. I love this, pr this program this year. I'm really proud of it. I hope that people enjoy it as much as we enjoyed putting it together. And it's great to hand it off. We've been holding this thing <laughs> in us. Absolutely. This is the day where it's like, Phew, now it's yours, people. <laughs> enjoy. Yeah. All right. So, Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. <clears throat> oh.